things that I don't think many realize is that evangelicalism looks slightly different in the different cultural contexts in which it finds itself. Being a person who has traveled back and forth through different countries, what do you see is, let, let's just state these two areas, British evangelicals and American evangelicals, what do you see as the similarities and the differences? I would want to emphasize the similarities. I strongly believe that the movement begun in the 1730s was a movement that affected both sides of the Atlantic. That's natural. Uh, the American side would then, then consist of colonies of Great Britain. Those colonies were occupied by people who had direct correspondence with people back in Britain. When the Great Awakening first sprang up, Jonathan Edwards corresponded about it with Congregationalist members of the same denomination back in London. So th there is a very close affinity. And I do think that the movement was extraordinarily similar for the rest of the 18th century through the 19th century and to a large extent in the 20th and even the 21st centuries. I have to say, however, that there has been divergence over time. And I would see that the divergence between the movements becomes much more marked from the beginning of the 20th century onwards. In the 19th century, before that, it was extraordinarily easy for people to move from one side of the Atlantic to the other and to have no, no sense of significant difference between the expressions of the evangelical movement. After the start of the 20th century, there was. When British conservative evangelicals, those who wanted to sustain the core of biblical faith, went to America in the 1920s, they were alarmed by the degree of vitriol in the fundamentalist controversy. They felt that that was not what they were used to at home. And I do think that the fundamentalist controversy being much, much more potent in the United States and parts of Canada too, meant that there was a set of different attitudes that sprang up in America, which modifies the judgment that the movements are, are one. If you want me to be specific, one of the things that I quite like doing when I go to the States is attending as many Christian services as I can and taking detailed notes. I therefore have produced um, a couple of papers um, on evangelical sermons in late 20th century Britain and evangelical sermons in early 21st century uh, America, sorry, in both cases, America. And I, I've put together my, what, what I see in those movements. I sometimes wonder what people think when they see me taking copious notes <laughs> and services, and I'm a stranger, but they're, they're, I find them extraordinarily tolerant. And I do have a large number of bits of evidence about similarities and differences there, because, of course, I do that in this country, too. What do I see as being different? I, I think one of the things that worries me when I go to America is that there is much less intercession in most evangelical services. That is, prayer for people not associated with the church where the service is being held, not associated with the congregation there present, but outside it. There is less prayer for events in the wider world in particular but also events sometimes in the surrounding secular society. Now with us, intercession will be regarded as almost de rigueur. I have been to services where the has, intercession has been deficient in, in Britain, but I think it, there's a tendency for it to be left out, even at really good evangelical churches, to a far greater extent than I would wish in the States. Again, uh, I find the attitude to what some Christians of the States call the ordinances, other Christians would call them the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, is, is very much um, perfunctory. Even believers' baptism, where in churches which practice it, tends to be very brief and extraordinarily non-emphasised in Baptist and Pentecostal churches in the state, whereas in Britain that would be regarded as a major event and it would be emphasised and be the culmination of a worship service, not 
hidden away at the start as it tends to be in the services that I've attended. And the communion service, the Lord's Supper, is much less frequent in the States than it is in Britain, by and large. There are some, a few churches who do practice it weekly, but in Scottish Baptist churches, for example, and I am a member of a Scottish Baptist church, communion is every Sunday. Hmm. Now, that, that degree of frequency is not universal in Britain, in any denomination, although it's common in Anglican churches. Um, but the contrast is really quite striking. In the States, I feel deprived because I don't have communion very often, and I, and I regret that. Now, OK, that, that's been saying, OK, America is not like Britain, and that's sad. And in those respects, I do feel that. However, there are aspects of American evangelicalism that are much, much more potent and admirable than their, their equivalents in Britain. For example, especially in the south of the states, there is a willingness to appeal to the congregation to make decisions then and there. Those appeals are not unknown in Britain, but they're very rare indeed. And I do think that there are lots of occasions when it's entirely appropriate to make appeals for people actually to submit to the yoke of Christ then and there. And I've seen that happen. I went, for example, to a uh, Native American revival service in uh, Oklahoma about 15 years ago. And that service had a Shawnee preacher who was dressed up in Indian headdress and Indi Indian um, armaments. He had shield and spear and so on. And he gave a remarkable revival address. The congregation consisted of two white people, the pastor of the church and me, and everybody else was Native American, not just Shawnees. In fact, very few of them were out there. At the end of that service, after that sermon, 13 people went forward. And OK, many of them may have been for rededication. But I'm sure that some of those were first time commitment. Now, that I find up wrong. The legacy of revivalism, therefore, is much stronger in America than it is with us. And I admire that and um, hope that what's going on at Asbury at the moment will reinvigorate that tradition and make it live over the long term. So, yes, there are significant differences. And I think, as in most respects, America wins in some ways, Britain wins in others. I int intend, in fact, um, at some stage in, in my life to try and propose the creation of a new territory in mid-Atlantic where the best of both sides of the, uh, of the <laughs> Atlantic are put into practice. And this will be true of the secular world, so that, for example, rear windshield wipers will be required in all cars, <laughs> but also in the Christian world. And in the Christian world, there'll be lots of revivals, as well as regular communion and regular and, and more emphasis on baptism and more emphasis on intercession. Where, where were you in Oklahoma? I'm just curious. Shorty, Oklahoma Baptist University is very kindly happy to speak on many occasions when I've been in the States. I very much appreciate their hospitality. I was there uh, back in November, uh, quite recently. And there are lots of Native Americans around there. And that is, after all, Indian territory. And I have been fascinated to go to some of the uh, former reservations and see what Christian worship there is there. On, on another occasion, for example, I was taken to a reservation only about 20 miles, I should think, out of Shawnee, and I attended a service there. And I was also told by the, the resident missionary, who was part of a succession of resident evangelical Quaker mission, missionaries ever since the 1870s, but it's still his responsibility, not just to preach the gospel, but also to teach settled agricultural methods, which had been so ever since the late 19th century. He still did. The sad thing there was that about 20 years before, I think it was, some years before, anyhow, there were people on the reservation who were translating the New Testament into the language of that tribe because the New Testament didn't exist yet in the language of that tribe. One of the missionaries actually ran over one of the children on the reservation and killed the child 
And after that, all cooperation with Bible translation was stopped. So there is a tribe in the heart of the United States of America, which does not yet have the Bible in its own language. And I found that very extraordinary. What tribe is that? Do you know? I, I do know, and I have it in my notebooks, but I'm afraid my memory has let it escape me on this occasion. That's okay. The reason I asked that question is that my mentor was the first white man to be trained to be an Indian or Native American uh, medicine man. And then oh, he right. gave his life to Jesus. And then he dedicated his life to reaching. He called them Indians. Um, he's with Jesus now. But he worked in Oklahoma at the Native American Bible Ministries. He created a Bible camp and a Bible center. And he, more than any other person, taught me about culture. I'd never seen someone that understood how someone thought in forms that I didn't understand. Just as an example, he, he tells a story, and I've shared this before on air, where he went to a reservation and there was an old man sitting on a bench and he sat down with him and they, they sat together for eight hours and never spoke. He said the old, the old man would nod and I would not, I would nod back and, and, or he would point and I would point or, and they would nod at each other. After eight hours, the old man spoke. And he said they had a pleasant conversation. And, and the missionary who had been there, I'm not exactly sure of the period of time, but it was maybe two years, came over and saw the conversation. And then after the conversation was done, approached my mentor. And he said to him, how is it that you got that old man to speak? I, I've been here for two years, and I've never got that man to say anything but good morning. And he said, you don't understand the culture. You have to wait for the older to address the younger. And, and so he, he, he actually would tell us about sports because he took us on mission trips. He took a lot of students on mission trips to Ringold, Oklahoma. And there he, he said, they'll play you in sports, but they'll never beat you. Or I mean, they won't beat you by more than one or two points because they don't want to shame you. He said, if you play American baseball, he said, and you get two strikes and the third strike you're out, they will give you four straight balls to walk you because they don't want to shame you. So I, I learned so much about culture because he said also in America, yeah. we think, or it, white Anglos, excuse me. He said, we think in threes, they think in fours. Uh -huh. So I, I would learn just remarkable uh -huh. things about the development of the faith. And that, that leads to another part of this discussion. Well, could, 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 I, could I come in there and follow yeah. that up a bit? Uh, first, there's my, my enthusiasm for thinking in fours. Clearly, all good Native Americans will accept the federal <laughs> uh, But that's a class. <laughs> I, I have actually done some work on the Seminole tribe in particular. I wrote an article on their reception of the Christian faith through the Baptists in the 19th century a few years ago. In order to do that, I've explored Seminole life a bit because they are flourish in Seminole County, Oklahoma, which is very close to Shawnee, where I go regularly. And the library at Oklahoma Baptist University contains excellent sources, written sources for this. Um, the chief, in fact, of the tribe is now a Baptist minister, intriguingly, and he has he fixed up for me and my wife to go to a Seminole church to attend when we were there back in November, which we very much enjoyed. I have been to a Seminole church before that, a Baptist church, and attended the service, and I, I enjoyed its distinctive culture. I especially enjoyed seeing pegs at the back of the church and there were sticks hanging from them and it was explained to me that these were deacon sticks so the deacons could go up and down the aisles and prod people who were falling asleep during the service. <laughs> so there are distinctive features of seminole culture that i've come to terms with too i think that could usefully be applied in other churches too <laughs> <laughs> 